morning, Center Point Church. Let's stand up together, even in our homes, and let's worship an amazing God together. Welcome to Centerpoint Church Online. I am Pastor Esther, and this is my handsome husband, Pastor Keith. Yes, and good morning. Listen, we are here to help you, help you connect with God, connect with each other, and ultimately serve the world and expand the kingdom of God. And uh, if you haven't connected with us already, please text the word connect uh, to the number that you'll find on the screen. And if you have children, elementary age or preschool age, we have a special service for them. And this week it's on truth and how important is it for us to teach our children to live truth-filled lives. Anyway, you can find that link in the message section. 
Also, if you'd like to join us for prayer tonight, there is a Zoom prayer meeting. We do pray for our community. We pray for Northern Virginia and our country in this moment and, uh, and our missionaries around the world. So you're welcome to join in on that Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And ladies, we have a very special event this coming Friday. Uh, it is it is called the quarantine. We've done them before, but this time we're going to have some games that we're going to play together, have a lot of fun laughing, but then also praying together. So I really encourage you to be a part of that at seven o'clock this Friday. So some exciting news is that we are able to meet back in the movie theater in Fairfax Corner, the Cinemark Theater, on August the 23rd. And so be looking for that information. We are excited to see you again. Now we've been in a new sermon series called Legacy, or we're entering into a new sermon series called Legacy. We're starting next week, and it's a great time to invite your neighbors or someone who's never uh, been connected to a church before. It's gonna be a good series for them, and also will kind of connect you to your neighbors and friends. We, we plan on inviting our neighbors to watch our service online, and then have a discussion about what it means to have a godly legacy. Now I wanna thank every one of you who's been, who's been faithfully contributing uh, to the church. Thank you for your generosity. It has helped us continue to do ministry here and serve our missionaries around the world. You have been faithful. I just wanna thank you for that. You can give in multiple ways. As the graphic on the screen shares, you can give through the link in the description. You can give through the CP Church app and you can text to give. And today we wind up a series that we've been in about the Beatitudes. We've called it the Paradoxology, studying who God is through the paradoxes found in the Beatitudes. And today, Pastor Brandon, our family life pastor, brings the message on mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So let's welcome Pastor Brandon this morning. As we start today's message, we want to take a few moments and allow God to speak to us through his word. So start by getting in a comfortable and upright position and take a few deep breaths. I'll pray this with me. God, I want to grow closer with you. Grant me the grace of your Holy Spirit to listen carefully for your voice. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 5 verses 2 through 10. And he, Jesus, began to teach them the Beatitudes. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Was there a word or phrase that resonated with you from this passage? Hold that in your mind for a few seconds. As you reflect, what would you like to say back to God? Take a moment to thank God for this step in your journey. And as we move into the message on mercy, pray this with me. Almighty God, give us grace at this time to be of one accord. As you have promised through Jesus, your son, 
When two or three are gathered in your name, you are in the midst of them. Grant us both knowledge of your truth and wisdom to walk in that knowledge with your lives. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Hannah. I hope that um, through that reflection on the Beatitudes that God was able to speak with you at home. Um, today, I'm actually going to be focusing on one of the Beatitudes where Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive a mercy. And so, this will be a great opportunity for you to show me some mercy. But I want to thank Pastor Keith for giving me this opportunity to share the message today. So, hello, Pastor Keith. Thanks. Um... Before we get into this beatitude, though, I'd like to just do a little bit of review. And so the series we're on is called Paradoxology, which by definition is the study of paradoxes. So what is a paradox? A paradox is something that doesn't seem to make sense, but is really true. And we've been specifically exploring paradoxes found within chapter 5 of Matthew's biography about Jesus found in the Bible. Um, and this passage is probably better known as the Beatitudes. And as I was preparing for this message, Emery asked me, she said, Dad, what's a Beatitude? And I, I had to actually look it up. And the term Beatitude, I found out, comes from the Latin biti sunt, meaning literally highest blessing. So this is Jesus sharing about how to have the highest blessing within his kingdom as a citizen of God's kingdom. And as we've looked at so far, Pastor Keith and Pastor Ashley have explored some of the paradoxes and beatitudes, such as asking the questions, how does somebody who is poor inherit an entire kingdom, let alone God's kingdom? Uh, they've explored how does mourning, loss, lead to comfort? They've explored how being humble leads to inheriting the entire earth. And they've explored the question of, out of everything that I could possibly do, how does being a peacemaker make me a child of God? And that brings us to today's beatitude, um, which, as a reminder, is blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And when you first hear this beatitude, it doesn't really sound like a paradox. I mean, if you give mercy, you get mercy. If you give something, you get something. What goes around comes around. And so if you give mercy, it just makes sense that you should receive mercy. And what I'm going to kind of walk through today is how, what, what I'm going to call a reverse paradox. And a reverse paradox is something that seems to be true on its face, but doesn't really make sense. And my hope is that through this message, you won't walk away simply saying, oh, that was a good word, but that you'll walk away saying, I need God to do a good work within me. And as I'm going through this message, I'm actually at points going to um, ask some questions. And normally when public communication is happening, a question is thrown out and then answered immediately by the person asking the question. But what I want to do today is actually I'm going to, I'm going to ask a few of the questions and pause. And when I pause, don't worry, the video has not, it's not frozen. I'm just allowing you some time to answer the question that I put out there because I think that when we wrestle with questions within ourselves, a lot more work can be done by the Holy Spirit than if I simply throw a question out and then answer it from my own experience. And, I, and when I pause, I'm actually going to pause long enough to sing this song that you might know. 
He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 And by the time I'm finished with that, hopefully you have thought of an answer. And I think all of us just found out why I never lead worship. All right, so first question. As you hear this beatitude, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. What questions come to your mind? Here are the four questions that came to my mind. The first question is, what does Jesus mean when he says blessed? And Pastor Keith and Pastor Ashley have gotten into this a little bit, but uh, we're going to explore it a little more here as we work through the message. The second question that I thought of is, what is the difference between mercy and grace? The third question I thought of is, when have I experienced mercy at a deep, profound, and possibly even supernatural level? And the fourth question I thought of is, where have I, and do I still, fail to show mercy? So question number one, what does Jesus mean by blessed? Personally, when I first thought of this question, um, I came up with what is actually the incorrect definition. I began to think of just, you know, good things that have happened within my life. I thought of when I was a kid and my parents bought us a Nintendo for Christmas. I felt so blessed because my parents got me a Nintendo. I think of um, when I finally got my license and my parents got me a car. I felt blessed that my parents had given me a car. I remember in college when I got an unexpected scholarship, I felt blessed that I had received a scholarship. Um, and even this past uh, month in June, I, I thought of when um, Pastor Hannah's parents rented a lake house and invited us to be part of their vacation. Um, and I, I felt very blessed by that because they were being so generous. But that is not the blessing that Jesus is talking about when he says in the Beatitude, blessed are. What he's talking about is the idea of the contentment you feel when someone close to you is proud of you or when you have a right relationship with someone who is very close to you. So I thought of an analogy that for me was really helpful in and getting a sense of that right definition at a deeper level than, than just my head. And it's actually an analogy that has to do with baseball. And if you've never played baseball, that's okay. We're not going to get into any of the details of baseball. We're just going to give a scenario um, and then walk through that scenario. And it, it made me think of I'm coming up to the plate as a batter within a baseball game. It's the end of the game, there's only one out left. The bases are loaded, which means there's a person on each base. And if I get on base, we're down by one run. If I get on base, we tie the game. If I get a hit, we win the game. And so there's a lot of pressure. Um, it's, uh, I'm feeling the weight of the world on my shoulders. And so I step up to the plate um, as a batter, I get ready for the pitcher to wind up and throw his first pitch. And all of a sudden I hear from behind me, time out. And the ump stands back, puts his arms in the air, calls off the pitch. I turn and the third base coach is my dad. For you, it could be, it could be just someone that you're very close to, a best friend, your mom, a sibling, whoever. And, and he begins to walk toward me and I begin to walk toward him. And he gets to me and he puts his arm around my shoulder and, and he says, son, 
I know that you're feeling a lot of pressure right now. If you strike out or if you get out, this game is over and we've lost. If you get on base, the game's tied. If you get a hit, we win. I know that's a lot of pressure, son. But here's what I want you to know. That if you strike out or if you hit a home run, what we're going to do is after the game is I'm going to give you a big hug and we're going to go get ice cream. And in that moment, I just imagine all of the weight that I'm feeling. Suddenly, it kind of just goes away. It's like this person, the closest person in my life, just said that no matter what I do, whether I am a success or a failure in this moment, he's going to be proud of me. He's going to love me. And we're going to go out and we're going to get some ice cream together. And I just think of the feeling that I have in that moment. And that is the blessedness that Jesus is referring to um, here in the Beatitudes when he, said, when he says, blessed are. And so that brings me to my second question that, that came to my mind as I looked at this Beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And the second question I thought of is, what's the difference between mercy and grace? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the two terms, and then we're going to go to another analogy that will hopefully help us understand it a little more clearly. So the definition of grace is receiving something you don't deserve, and it can never be taken back or expired. Grace is receiving something you don't deserve and it can never be taken back or expired. Mercy is defined as deserving consequences for something you've done but not receiving them. Deserving consequences for something you've done but not receiving them. And so we're going to go back to baseball again, but this time we're not going to a baseball game. We're going to we're just we're just playing catch with a friend. We're throwing the baseball back and forth, um, just hanging out. And all of a sudden, I want to see just I want to see how far I can throw the ball. And so I wind up and just throw as hard as I can, not even trying to get it to my friend. It sails over my friend's head, over the fence of our backyard, and all of a sudden you hear the crash of breaking glass as the baseball has just gone through your neighbor's window. And so I imagine I do the right thing in this scenario, and I go and I knock on my neighbor's front door. And they open the door, and I look at them and say, I am so sorry. I just threw a baseball through your window. Please don't call the cops, because I don't have any money to pay for this. And, the, and, and my neighbor looks at me, and in grace, he says, not only am I not going to call the cops, but I'm not going to make you pay for it. And listen, if you were to throw the baseball through my window again, I'd give you the same response every time. You could do it a thousand times. You could do it a million times. But my response would be the same. I'm not going to call the cops, and I'm not going to make you pay for it. On the other hand, in this scenario, mercy, the, with mercy, the neighbor says, you know what, I see that you're in a bad circumstance with what happened. So what I'm going to do is this time I'm not going to call the cops. I'm not going to make you pay for it. But here's the deal. Next time, if this happens again, you're going to have to face the consequences. And so now we're on question. Where have I experienced mercy at a deep, profound, and possibly even supernatural level? And as I thought of this question for myself, there's many examples that came to mind within my life. But then, as I was thinking more about it, I thought of one of our students who's part of our youth group here at Center Point. And I, and I remembered a testimony that he had shared in our youth group a few months back. And I thought, man, that is such a powerful testimony of God's mercy within this young man's life. 
And so I asked him to write that testimony down so that he could share it with us today as part of the message. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going we're gonna to have um, Marcelo share his testimony. Hi, I'm Marcelo Gomez, if you haven't met me yet, and this is my testimony. So I've been at Center Point since I was about six years old. I'm 17 now, so 11 years at Center Point. It's been a long time. But throughout my early childhood at Center Point, I really, really didn't believe that much. Like, I knew there was a God. I knew there was Jesus, but I never really had a personal relationship with him until I was about 12 years old. At that point, I had entered the youth group, and then I started to, like, get a bit more faith, and I'm like, okay, you know, this this makes sense. It all adds up. So, so then that same year, we went to a youth camp, and God had called me to ministry then at 12 years old. But, like every 12 year old, I kind of just, oh, okay, moved on, stayed in the youth group, and at that point, I was slowly drifting, but not yet fully. And then um, going into my freshman year, I had lost my grandmother. And we were close, and we never met in person. And it almost had felt like God betrayed me at that moment. And I was angry, I was sad, and that was the point I gave up on God. And so then I started high school and I started making some bad friends who did bad influences. And so I had a plan to go hang out with them one weekend. But that Wednesday I went to youth group and it was youth convention and I wasn't going. And a spot opened up and they're like, we're giving you the spot. I'm like, oh, cool. A little fun weekend. Get out the house a bit hang out with friends, but so then it was the story of Naaman with the seven dips into the river that healed his leprosy, and they had us go up to the front, and for those who needed it to do the seven dips, and as each dip went on, I just felt weight being pulled off, and at that point, it was just God's mercy right there. He could have let me go out and do whatever, but he said... He didn't let that happen. He pulled me back. And by the time that was over, I had felt the call to ministry. And ever since then, since March 16th, 2018, I've been dedicated to following Jesus. Now, this summer, I'm interning at Center Point, And I had just recently just applied to Bible College Ministry School. And everything has just opened up the way it needed to be. And I, I give all praise to God for that. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Um, it's so cool that Marcelo has gone from having a call into ministry and ignoring it to then having that call renewed and making a decision to follow that call. And now he's actually begun to walk it, walk it out. About three weeks ago, he started an internship here at Center Point, and we're really walking with him in that call now to figure out how to do practical ministry, how to be a pastor, and I'm really excited for the future that God has for him. And so that brings us back to this third question. When have you experienced mercy at a deep, profound and possibly even supernatural level. Maybe there was a time in your life when you strayed from God and he showed mercy to you by calling you back. I can think of eighth grade. Maybe there was a time in your life where you faced an impossible circumstance and God in his mercy intervened. I can think of South Korea Maybe there was a time when another person showed you great mercy that you did not think you were going to receive. I think of Pastor Baker. Maybe there was a time when God entered into a broken relationship in his mercy and brought healing. I can think of Thomas. So 
Now I'm going to actually ask you to answer this question. When have you experienced mercy at a deep, profound, and possibly even supernatural level? Now, as we take that moment into our minds, maybe it'll be helpful to close your eyes, but I want you to think about that moment where you received deep, profound, and possibly supernatural mercy. I want you to to keep that in your mind and not just look at the circumstances of it, not just think about what happened, but think about how you felt in that moment the gratitude you felt, the contentment you felt, the thanksgiving that you felt. Whatever your feelings, hold on to the feelings that you had in that moment of receiving mercy. And as I was preparing for this message and doing this exercise personally, it really made me think of what we have through salvation. In Jesus. Um, it made me think about God's country. In the Bible, God's country is called heaven, and how heaven is this perfect place where there's no sin, there's no evil, um, bad things no longer happen. Um, there, everyone lives in peace and unity together. Um, heaven's just this perfect place. And I thought about how all the times that I've needed mercy, and not just simple or small amounts of mercy, but deep, profound, supernatural mercy. And it made me realize that I'm not perfect. And if heaven is this perfect place, if God's kingdom is this perfect place, and I'm not perfect, if I've needed mercies and my imperfections, then I can't get into heaven on my own. Because if imperfection were to enter into a perfect place, that place would no longer be perfect. And so I need help, right? And that is where Jesus comes in. Jesus lived a perfect life. He presented proof after proof while he was on earth that showed he was the savior of the world, that he was the only way to be saved from eternal death. And Jesus lived this perfect life, proved that he was the only way to be saved from death, and then willingly and lovingly allowed himself to be killed, allowed himself to be sacrificed for you, for me, for everyone. And then three days later, he came back to life. And not only did he come back to life, but he showed himself to hundreds of eyewitnesses before he finally ascended into heaven to be with God. And all the while, he made this promise that he would cover the imperfections of anyone who believed in him and that he would make a home for them in heaven. And you can read all about these things in, in the biographies of Jesus written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John within the Bible. But if you're hearing this message, this good news of, of hope, that you can be saved through Jesus, that your imperfections can be covered, that Jesus can make a home for you in heaven, and that's resonating with your spirit. And you're feeling this pull to respond, this desire to have a relationship with Jesus. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me and begin that relationship, begin that journey. And so you're, if you're at home and you'd like to do that, I'd like you to repeat this prayer after me. Father in heaven, I admit that I'm not perfect. And I admit that I need help. 
I believe in you, King Jesus. And I believe in your power to save me. I choose to follow you today and every day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, so let it be. All right, so let's review. The first question we asked is, what does Jesus mean when he says blessed? And Jesus does not mean that you got a free car, but he means that it's that that feeling of contentment you get when your best friend has his or her arm around your shoulder, the person closest to you in this life, and you just have this sense, we're good. I've made mistakes, I will make mistakes, but we're good. And we looked at the difference between grace and mercy, and we looked at the analogy of throwing a baseball through through the window, and grace says, I will forgive you every single time. I will take the consequences on myself every single time for you breaking my window. Mercy says, I'll let you off the hook this one time. But next time, unless I decide to show mercy again, you have to face the consequences. So that brings us to question number four. Where have I and do I still fail to show mercy? For me, I think of a couple small things. I think of a couple weeks ago when my son Tristan, he's just a toddler, but he was eating cereal in our living room and he spilled his bowl and milk and cereal went all over the carpet. And I came into the room and I just completely laid into him. I told, I was like, Tristan, how could you do this? This is why I never let you eat your cereal outside of the kitchen. What were you thinking? How could you be so careless? And all the while I can just tell that he's just shriveling up inside, that, that I had this opportunity to show mercy but instead I completely laid into him and just saw him wilt in front of me. And then I think about times that I've spilled stuff. I mean, (laughs) I've spilled many things in my life, um, specifically on carpet. And I've always just been like, oh, well, it happens. I'll just go ahead and clean it up quick and then we'll move on. Another small example I thought of is Um, I had gotten Pastor Hannah a new phone, and a couple days after I got her the new phone, she was doing something, and it it just kind of slipped out of her hand and fell and landed on the floor in the perfect way for the screen to be cracked. And again, I just completely laid into her. I said, you've had this phone two days. How could you break it already? I've had my phone for two years and I never cracked the screen. Why did you get this case that's pretty instead of one that actually protects it? Like, how could you be so careless? Come on, this is an expensive phone. And I just completely lit into her. Completely showed a lack of mercy in that circumstance. And then I think of times where I've broken a phone. And you know what I say to myself? I say, Brandon, that's okay. This is just an opportunity to get a new phone. I think of time, a time I failed to show mercy in a bigger way. And I think of this boss that I had when, when I had come out of college. And he was just he was just not a nice guy. Every opportunity he had to be rude to me or put me down or make me feel bad about myself, he took that opportunity and 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 he put me down and he made me feel bad about myself. And so eventually that that I, I left that job and a couple years later after I left the job, I heard that um, my boss's life had kind of imploded that his personal life was just in a shambles, that um, he, his wife had left and taken the kids and he was just in a really bad place personally. And you know, in that moment, my first thought was, well, he finally got what was coming to him. He finally reaped what he sowed. 
This is just his, uh, just desserts. And I showed no mercy. Instead of what I could have said was, man, I wish that God would come into this situation. I wish that God would bring transformation. I wish that God, or I pray that God would, would bring healing within what's happening. But instead I failed. I failed miserably at showing mercy. And this kind of brings us um, to another question. Where have you failed to show mercy? So now we have come full circle back to this idea of a reverse paradox. And to remind you what a reverse paradox is, it's something that seems to be true, but doesn't actually make sense. And so when we look at this beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, I realize something. I realize that in my life, what I want is mercy for myself but justice for others. I, what I would like this, pair, this, this beatitude to read is, Blessed are the just, for they shall receive mercy. I accept mercy so easily and so naturally, but then I fail to give mercy so easily, so naturally. And sometimes I'm so bad at being a merciful person that I even lack self-awareness around the fact that I am not merciful. And it makes me think of the, the passage where Jesus is, um, is sharing a parable in Matthew 18 about this man who owes millions of dollars to a king. And the king brings the man before him and he calls in his debt and he says, I need the money, it's due. And the, the man who owes millions of dollars gets on his knees and he begs and pleads and says, please just give me a little more time. And the king decides that he's not just going to give him more time, but he's going to mercifully forgive the entire debt. And what does this man who just had millions of dollars of debt forgiven immediately go and do? He immediately goes to a servant of his, a worker of his, who owes him a few thousand dollars. And he says to the servant, I'm calling in the debt, give me the money that you owe me. And the servant gets on his hands and his knees and he begs and he says, please just give me a little more time. And the man who had just had millions of dollars forgiven says, I'm not just going to give you a little more time. I'm going to forgive your entire debt. Actually, that's not should have done. That's what you think he would have done. But what he actually did was say, okay, well, if you can't pay me right now, I'm going to throw you in jail and you can work off your debt. And that's what he did. And of course, word got back to the king who had forgiven his millions of dollars and that king called him back. And I imagine at this point that the man got down on his hands and knees again and begged for mercy a second time. But the king said, because you failed to show mercy to your worker, I'm going to give you the consequences that you deserved in the first place. And he threw that man in prison to work off his debt until it was paid in full. And it made me realize that I am that man. I accept mercy so easily. It's so natural for me to accept mercy. But it's so hard. It's so unnaturally, unnatural for me to show mercy. And so as we look at how to respond to this message, to this beatitude that Jesus spoke um, the question I want to ask is, what good work does God want to do in you through this message? 
Maybe you decided to follow Jesus today. Maybe you decided to begin a relationship with him. And the good work that he wants to start is for you to seek out someone you know who is a Christian and ask if they'll help walk with you, if they'll help you to grow and learn how to follow Jesus now that you've made that decision. Or maybe you don't know a Christian and you can reach out to Centerpoint and we'll find someone to walk with you. Maybe your response is to ask God for a new outpouring of mercy within a specific area of your life where you need mercy or where you're struggling to accept mercy. Or maybe you need to seek forgiveness for unmercy or unmercifulness that has been revealed within your life, within specific situations, within specific relationships, within specific ways. Um, or, or even seeking forgiveness for so easily desiring and accepting mercy for yourself, but not giving it to others. So what I would like us to do is to take a moment um, and respond to God right now in our own words. Now to conclude, I would like to invite us to respond together. I've asked Christy to lead us in a, a congregational prayer on mercy. Um, and as she prays, I would like each of us watching uh, along with the worship team to repeat after her out loud. And the reason that I would like us to pray along out loud to actually speak the prayer out loud is for two reasons. And the first is that speaking out loud, even though we're not together in person, gives us an opportunity to, in humbleness and unity, come together as a community of believers. Because all of us within our separate homes, separate places that we're watching this message, are going to be joining together in unity and humility as we, we pray for mercy. And secondly, um, the physical is just sometimes so intertwined with the supernatural that when we do something physical, it can actually create breakthrough within the supernatural. And so I would like to go ahead now and, um, and hand this off to Christy as she leads us in prayer and a worship song. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, help us to walk in the ways of your blessing, sensing the proud love of a father. Thank you for your unfailing grace and also your generous mercy on us sinners. Forgive us for the times we have not shown mercy to loved ones or to those whom we struggle to love or to the stranger or even those on TV or social media we do not know. As we go forth, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your mercy to others, not only with our lips, but in our very living. We're going to read from Psalm 51 before we start singing. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit.
you, Pastor Brandon and worship team. Let's continue to reflect on that message this week. And if you do need prayer, please don't hesitate to ask. We are here for you, we'll pray for you. You can just email us at info at centerpointchurch.com and we'd love to hear from you at that point. And we hope to see you tonight via Zoom on our prayer meeting time together. So have a great week. Yes, God, God bless. bless.